We are thrilled. We finally found our dream home in the mountains. The views are great. The air is fresh. It is bear country, though. Hey, boo-boo! We hit the jackpot! Bear, bear, bear. Look, corn on a cob! Ooh, chicken. Don't mind if I do. You're hungry. Peabone! That's what I call a smorgasbord. At least Geico makes bundling our home and car insurance easy. They do save us a ton of money. We'll take the cobbler to go. Good idea, Yogi. Now I'm smarter than the average bear. They're gone, Dad. For bundling made easy, go to geico.com. Listen, don't miss Jungle Cruise. It's a lot of fun. It's in theaters and on Disney Plus with premiere access with the one and only Veronica Falcone. All right, now get ready for some designer name dropping. Only we have a peek inside Kathy Hilton's closet. Happening now. The unvaccinated getting hit hardest in this latest surge of COVID-19 in Bear County. Officials urging people once again to get their vaccines. It's day five of the punishment phase for Otis McCain, and today the defense finally presenting their witnesses will have more. That's coming up. Rain chances. They spike before the weekend. I'll be back to talk about how hot it'll be then on Saturday and Sunday. The news at five starts right now. And we begin with breaking news, a traffic trouble spot. This is I-10 and Hebner. We're looking at the eastbound lanes down to just one lane right now. Four lanes blocked, and you can see there's a flatbed trailer there. It appears that they are pulling at least one car away. There may be more cars involved in this accident. Again, this is the eastbound lanes. You can see the skid marks on the road, uh, an area that you want to avoid probably for the next half hour at least. Yeah, Samuel King will have our traffic update coming up in just a few minutes. But first, local officials once again urging residents to be vaccinated in the face of the latest surge in COVID-19 cases. The seven-day average of new cases reported yesterday up nearly double over the week before. It's time to pay attention. There are more than six times as many hospitalizations as there were on average at the beginning of July. Garrett Berger takes us into the latest statistics to show us this latest wave is largely due to the unvaccinated. As COVID cases in San Antonio climb again, they're climbing very differently for vaccinated and unvaccinated residents. So for anyone who says that the vaccine doesn't matter, that it doesn't work, take a look at that graph. 5.3% of new cases in the past four weeks have been breakthrough cases in fully vaccinated individuals, while 88% of currently hospitalized COVID patients are unvaccinated. As we've said before, getting vaccinated is your best protection against severe disease, hospitalizations, and death. One of the unvaccinated victims of the latest surge is comedian Cleto Rodriguez in the hospital since July 24th. The first week his wife says was a battle for his life. Just trying to breathe and, uh, the uh, hospital staff, the nurses, just using every um, way possible to just get that air to get pushed into his lungs because of that COVID pneumonia. Though Metro Health Assistant Director Anita Curian says vaccinations have been picking up, it hasn't been as dramatic as officials would like. And the number of breakthrough cases is worrying too. A person who's infected with the Delta variant can infect on an average eight to nine folks. If everybody's not fully vaccinated, we expect these cases, these breakthrough infections to increase. That could keep the transmission of, of COVID-19 ongoing in our communities. Korean said they only know of four deaths of vaccinated people so far. However, she says they were severely immunocompromised and their deaths are still under investigation. More than 3,600 people have died from COVID in Bear County so far. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And while discussing the growing hospital rates during today's briefing, Judge Nelson Wolf also spoke about the need to vaccinate to protect children who are not yet eligible to get the vaccine, especially as we enter a new school year. In the last uh, pandemic uh, wave, uh, the oldest uh, uh, person that we had in the hospital with COVID was 18 years old in the university hospital. We have one in the hospital right now that's 11 months old. So children are very vulnerable to this disease as well. On to the national fight against COVID-19 now. A senior White House official says it's quite possible the FDA will grant full authorization of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine by mid-September or even earlier. And that would be a game changer for those who have hesitated. ABC's Ike Jachi is in Washington with more. Promising news on the vaccine front. A senior White House official telling ABC News it's quite reasonable the FDA will fully approve Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. I do hope it's going to be within the next couple of weeks. They said hopefully by the end of the month. I hope it's even 
Sooner than that, the news comes as the World Health Organization's latest weekly COVID report confirms a global increase of over 4 million new cases of COVID-19. The U.S. leading the world in new infections, over 543,000, a 68% increase over the previous week. The CDC now forecasting hospitalizations from COVID could triple this month, suggesting admissions could climb to 24,000 a day by the end of the month. COVID attacking cases. Kids. Officials saying 72,000 children contracting the virus in the last week alone. The question over requiring masks in schools, a hotly contested topic following the CDC's recommendation last week. Wednesday, Illinois' governor announcing a statewide school mask mandate. Tuesday night, a battle over a school mask mandate at a Chicago suburb ended in an altercation in the hallway after a contentious school board meeting. Vaccinations are on the rise, up 73% over the last three weeks, especially in states where transmission is highest. President Biden urging those in the private sector to begin requiring vaccinations and calling out states who have banned mask mandates. But you aren't going to help at least get out of the way of the people who are trying to do the right thing. Use your power to save lives. Now, speaking of mask mandates, Arkansas's governor called a special session to lift the ban on school mask mandates. Asa Hutchinson said he wanted to amend the law to allow schools to decide their own mask policies. Ike Ajaji, ABC News, Washington. And we know people still have a lot of questions about the COVID vaccine and whether or not they should be vaccinated. Even those that are vaccinated have questions about kids. And we have a phone bank right now that we will be checking in with momentarily uh, in the KSAT Studio B. That'll be coming up a little bit later in this newscast. The number there you see 210-351-1363 experts on hand to answer your questions to other news. Now at five Judson ISD paying more than $500,000 in ransom in an effort to be transparent following a recent ransomware attack. The district says it made that payment in order to protect sensitive information from being released. It was back in June. The attack left the district without phone or email access, though the severity of the breach remains unclear. In a statement today, the district said while they'd rather use the money for the needs of employees and students, there was no other choice for them to ensure safety. Coming up at six, our Jesse DeGriato spoke with a cybersecurity expert who breaks down the situation. Those who may miss SAPD Detective Benjamin Marconi the most taking the stand today. Another emotional day in the courtroom as jurors decided the sentencing of convicted murderer Otis McCain. And today the jury hearing for Marconi's brother, among others, Erica Hernandez, joining us live now from the courthouse with more on that testimony. And the defense actually presented some witnesses today as well, Erica. Yeah, that's correct, Steve. Well, today we started off with Tom Marconi. He is Benjamin Marconi's brother. He talked about who his brother was and how his murder affected the entire Marconi family. Now, he described Detective Marconi as a true role model to all who had a true passion for helping others. Tom Marconi also talked about the moment he heard his brother had been killed. I just uh, couldn't believe what I was seeing, that this was my brother had just been murdered. I honestly probably blacked out quite a bit of, the, of some of that trauma. Now, the state did rest this afternoon and the defense began presenting character witnesses on behalf of McCain. His best friend took the stand and spoke about how McCain not only helped raise his sisters, but helped him as well. I had a rough upbringing. I was just, uh, volunteered his his house to me and opened his door to me and really honestly saved my life as far as I don't know where I would have been if I didn't have nowhere to go. Now right now on the stand is Otis McCain's mother. We'll have more on her testimony coming up at six. Reporting live from the Bear County Courthouse, Erica Hernandez, Case at 12 News. Thank you, Erica. It is worth noting today that Judge Ron Ronhell announcing the suspension of jury services amid this surge in COVID-19 infections. Trials like the one that's underway in the case of Otis McCain will be allowed to continue until the verdict is reached and then none will begin. You can read more about the decision right now at KSAT.com.
We've got some breaking news we want to get to right now. Apparently two people, at least two people, shot in the 200 block of Parchman. This is south of Southwest Military Drive, and you can see police and EMS on the scene. A very heavy police presence here. We've got Sky 12 up. They are now searching for a suspect, we're told. Again, this is an active scene on Parchman, uh, just south of Southwest Military Drive. Um, we will bring you as much information as we can. We do have a crew en route, and we'll try to bring you more information about this active shooting, two people down, and a suspect apparently still on the loose. There's some action on the radar this afternoon. It's generally south of San Antonio. You see over the past few hours some development, especially along I-35 between Catula and Dilly. And, and Dilly, this is headed your way right now. So some downpours along the interstate there, and they stretch westward toward Las Colonias and then just south of La Prior there. And this is some scattered, widely separated hit or miss activity and a few other showers to talk about. We'll get to those in a few minutes. But rain chances do increase, by the way, as we get into tomorrow. Right now, temperature wise, 86 in Del Rio. Some clouds helping them out. 87 Floresville. By the way, Panama Maria picked up over two inches of rainfall overnight from a downpour that developed. Temperature wise though right now we're 92 in Universal City, Windcrest at 90. So temperatures falling through the 80s this evening. A few showers out there at 7, 8 o'clock, especially south of town. And then the rain chances increase closer to the Rio Grande overnight. And then everybody's chances elevate into tomorrow. We're going to talk more about that along with what happens into the weekend with warmth and temperatures then coming up. Thank you, Adam. Federal funding helping VIA speed up some service improvements, potentially giving more people access to faster service. Yeah, our Samuel King joins us now. Sam, the agency receiving millions so far. At least 270 million across the various stimulus packages, Stephen Ursula and President and CEO Jeff Arndt says that's enabling VIA to move ahead with plans for a new rapid transit line, advanced rapid transit line between the north and south sides. Instead of opening in 2032, it could potentially open as soon as 2027. Arndt spoke to the downtown Rotary Club this afternoon. He also says VIA Link, the agency's answer to Uber and Lyft, will launch its expansion to more zones next year. Again, thanks to federal spending. It's enabled us to say, oh, this thing that we were going to start in 2025 when we had more money, we can start it in 2022. Arn said otherwise, VIA would have had to wait for the sales tax revenue approved by voters last year to kick in. Coming up at six, more on the agency's efforts to increase frequency and access. As Steve mentioned at the top of the newscast, we have a major crash on I-10. This is eastbound at Heatner. So let's go over to the wall, show you this uh, really quickly. The good news here is they picked up the vehicle. So you see uh, one truck there on the side there, and you see one truck there. So that gives us an indication that sort of the immediate thing is over. Now it's just a matter of uh, cleaning up and making sure everything is okay there. But you can see the impact on traffic eastbound, no traffic moving there. And in westbound, you see the lanes uh, slow. So again, let's look at that on the map down to six miles per hour there, 12 miles per hour heading westbound. So keep that in mind this evening. Other parts of the area, we've had a number of crashes this evening. Some of them have cleared up already. Uh, still watching the situation at I-10 and Bernie Stage. And also for another 45 minutes or so, some construction here on Highway 90 and State Highway 211. That's causing a lot of slowdowns as well. Keep an eye on things. Steve, Ursula. Thank you, Samuel. Turning back now to COVID-19 and the push to vaccinate. Right now, until 7 o'clock tonight, KSET and our community partners hosting a vaccine phone bank. The number to call there on your screen. We have doctors and nurses on hand ready to answer any questions you may have about the COVID-19 vaccines. One of them is Dr. Tess Barton, an infectious disease specialist with the university. She joins Ursula now. We are keeping an eye on the phones right now, but we have a couple of questions. Maybe it might spur you to, to ask the question that's been on the back of your mind. Tess Barton and I have been talking ever since the COVID uh, pandemic began a year ago. I feel like we're old friends. Um, the number one thing people need to understand is that kids are getting COVID and m many of them are unvaccinated. That's correct. So we are, we are seeing um, more kids than we've seen before coming in, um, getting diagnosed with COVID, as well as kids who are sick enough to get hospitalized. For example, today I saw three kids in our ICU. Wow. Um, and that kind of dispels that myth that, that, that the kids are all safe and it's just the parents 
and the grandparents that need to be protected. That's, that's correct. So we do know that kids generally have been spared kind of the worst of COVID, but not completely. You know, many kids have died of this. Many kids have had complications from COVID. And more to come, no doubt, unless action is taken. Unfortunately, yes. So the phone bank is underway, 351-1363. Make a phone call now if you have any questions. We'll be here until 7 o'clock tonight, and we'll be right back. Take a live look out there, 91 degrees. <laughs> Unusually cool. We're calling that August. cool? 91 in August? It's true. It could be 101. When exactly. are the dog days ever going to get here? Uh, right, they haven't this year. Maybe in August we'll settle in you know, as we get further into August, but right now the indication is that we're not going to get into those dog days of summer where it's just right near 100 every day or even into the 100s. Let's talk about rain chances. That's the big headline right now. Tomorrow, they boost a little bit. We get a little spike in rain chances tomorrow. Friday, they start to drop off and into the weekend, they're non-existent. We have some shower activity to speak of. Same frontal boundary stalled to the south of San Antonio, kickstarting these showers and thunderstorms. And you look at the activity as a whole, the vast majority of it south of San Antonio. But we are watching this outflow boundary from previous thunderstorms north of I-10. This is pushing southward, and it has a history of kickstarting its own little isolated showers near Gonzales, not far from Hallettsville as well. And as it continues to march southward, those of you in Wilson, Carnes, and DeWitt counties, you could have a brief shower pop up as a result of that. Nothing here in San Antonio right now, but we can't rule out one or two developing as we go through the evening hours. But the main activity is closer to the frontal boundary south of us, especially along I-35 near Catula, stretching over toward Carrizo Springs, a little bit even clipping Maverick County, uh, LaSalle, McMullen County, some heavy rain. And this is actually part of our area and our viewing area that really hasn't had as much rain over the past several days. This is rainfall since Sunday, and you see Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties. There's some big pockets of no rain there. We're starting to make up for that now, whereas you look at the Hill Country, Highway 90 west of town, impressive rainfall amounts. So we're starting to spread the love out a little bit more, and I think we'll continue to do that into tomorrow. So here's the big picture. Frontal boundary is still just south of San Antonio. It's a little bit closer to us now, but it's just south of town, and that's still going to be around tomorrow, acting as another triggering mechanism for some showers and storms. Bit of a focal point, but here's the key, and this is why we're boosting rain chances a bit tomorrow, so they'll become more numerous, is because a little bit of upper level support, a little upper level swirl here, here in northern Mexico, a little inverted trough, and then a, another one dropping in from the Great Plains, from the Central Plains. That's coming toward us from eastern Colorado. These will continue to drift basically over our area and just help us out a bit in terms of taking advantage of that instability, utilizing it and kickstarting more numerous showers and storms. And our future cast, it tends to agree with it. And by the way, overnight tonight along the Rio Grande, you could have a shower or thunderstorm at any time because of that initial upper level swirl. Look at 2 a.m. And this model in particular is kickstarting some downpours closer to Maverick County. And even first thing tomorrow morning, most of it west of San Antonio. But even around here, we could have a few developing. Once we get into the afternoon, peak heating of the day, the warmth helping us out a bit, along with that upper support, that's when we're likely to see some of that spotty activity developing on the radar screen, even in and around San Antonio. For example, this is 3 p.m. computer model showing that widely separated or scattered activity tomorrow afternoon. Not everybody's going to get it, but who does could quickly get one to two inches of rain just a short period of time. 75 the low, 92 the high temperature today. It's what Steve was talking about. Cool for this time of year with the average being 97 and the record 103. Right now we're at 92. Of course, we're all feeling the humidity. Dew point 60s to low 70s, but temperatures not bad for July. Catula rained cool air at 76. Kennedy 90, Kerrville 91, along with Uvalde and 88 in Rock Springs. You look locally and most of us in the lower 90s, but Canyon Lake 88 and burning out 86. As we go through the evening, we'll fall through the 80s tomorrow morning, mid 70s, then only upper 80s to near 90 degrees for the high temperature tomorrow with those increasing rain chances. So the showers and storms being a little more numerous again tomorrow afternoon in particular, tapering off a bit Friday, not as much in this weekend, just sunny mid 90s. Nice for August, nice for July, nice for June. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> nice summer so far. Yeah. All right, UTSA with an impressive unveiling. Today, yeah, and this right? is important to their recruitment effort because they're in Division One. And when we come back, we'll show you their brand new facility unveiled today. You saw it live at noon. Now you'll see it up close again here at five. And the Poteet Aggies picked at the top when we come back. Brand new University of Texas San Antonio Race Center was officially opened today. It stands for Roadrunner Athletic Center of Excellence. It's a $41 million athletic training facility located on almost 11 acres of land that was made possible by gifts, City of San Antonio 2017 bond referendum, and the Roadrunner Foundation. Outside of the building, two practice fields, one synthetic and the other natural turf, that will help the Roadrunners in Division I recruiting. This is just the beginning of our bold future for UTSA Athletics. It's the, the, the first piece of many to come, as Gene talked about, and it's something, again, we talk about this is all for our student athletes and for them to develop um, athletically, academically, and in life. So it's a great day. Inside the 95,000 square foot facility includes a 7,500 square foot locker room with 120 lockers, players meeting rooms along with coaches offices. There's also 14,000 square feet for strength and conditioning. Features a state of the art weight room, a sports medicine facility with exam treatment and recovery rooms. It also includes hydrotherapy and aquatic equipment and 7,000 square feet of academic spaces with a study hall and 10 private tutoring rooms. Tomorrow is going to be a big day. You know, we're going to film it when our players get to see it. And uh, I predict, you know, tears of joy of just, I can't wait to see the kids. UTSA also plans to share its race facility with the public through athletic camps and clinics. Our big game coverage previews continue today with a trip to Poteet, home of the Aggies. Poteet is ranked number 21 in the state in Class 3A Division I, according to Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine. Predicted to finish first in District 14 3 That's because Coach Darby House will welcome back 18 starters, nine each on offense and defense, off the team that went 8-3 last year, 5-1 and one in district. As part of those returning starters is star running back Ernest Davila, who had over 2,000 yards rushing with 20 touchdowns, another two receiving. Davila is also picked by Texas Football as a preseason All-State favorite. You know, these are a great group of kids. They're hardworking. Uh, ever since we got here, we've kind of, you know, we treat everybody the same. You know, Ernie works, you know, Ernest and Julian work just as hard as as the freshmen we expect to come in. We, we push them. We make them, we make them strive to be great. We have big expectations. Uh, we're looking to uh, go past first round, maybe even farther. I mean, we've been working f like for four years uh, just to get ready for this. The Poteet Aggies kick off their season on Friday, August the 27th at home against Bandera at 7.30. We continue our BGC previews tomorrow at 5. Yeah, they're on. Everybody's ready. Full yeah. effect. Yeah, thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Start of the day tomorrow in the 70s by the afternoon. Not really looking like a July uh, temperature map. 87 Uvalde, 88 Canyon Lake, 91. The high temperature in Del Rio tomorrow and for the most part, upper 80s to near 90. Elmendorf, for example, 89 and 86 for the high in Timberwood Park. Looking ahead, tomorrow, best chance of rain, some scattered activity, especially midday afternoon time frame. Friday, some pop up isolated showers and storms and sunny and dry this weekend. No one's complaining. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for watching the news at five. See you back here at six.